Hello, everybody. I was still typing a few notes. I'm Howie Hawkins. I was the Green Party candidate for president, as well as the Socialist Party candidate for president in 2020. And this podcast, Green Socialist Notes, is about educating and advocating for the eco-socialist program that my running mate, Angela Walker, and I ran on in 2020. So, you know, top of the news right now are these wars in Gaza and Ukraine and others around the world. In Gaza, the genocide continues. The $1.2 trillion spending package that Congress adopted a week ago Friday bars funding to UNRWA, which is the UN Relief and Works Agency, which has supported Palestinian refugees in Gaza, as well as Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon since the late 1940s. And with the crisis in Gaza, the U.S. has banned the funding. And the U.S. has been the big funder, over $400 million a year. Now they're short. Um, And, you know, the Biden administration officials are expressing in public frustration with Israel's slaughter of Gazan civilians, the failure to get food, water, medicine, and other humanitarian aid into Gaza, And they even let a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire, which they, you know, hadn't called for before, pass by abstaining. Uh, Yet, we find out yesterday in the Washington Post that the U.S. is now quietly sending another $2.5 billion military aid package to Israel, including 1,800 MK-84, 2,000-pound pound bombs. These are huge bombs. 500 MK-82, 500 pound bombs. And 25 F-35 fighter jets. Meanwhile, Ukraine is running out of artillery shells and air defense missiles as Russia prepares for a major offensive this spring because U.S. aid to Ukraine has been stalled in Congress for six months. It still doesn't have the F-16s that the U.S. promised over a year ago, let alone the more advanced F-35s that the U.S. is sending to Israel, 25 of them, very expensive. Uh, Ukraine has been using its homemade drones to degrade Russia's oil refining capacity to the point that uh, Russia announced on March 1st a six-month moratorium on exporting gasoline so they could use it for the war effort and for domestic purposes. Um, So that's been very effective, yet the U.S. has been telling Ukraine to stop doing that. Now, the U.S. set conditions on the weapons it did provide that can't be used on Russian territory, but Ukraine has made these uh, bombing runs with drones of Russian oil refineries with their own homemade drones, yet the U.S. is telling them to stop. You you begin to wonder, you know, is the U.S. really back in Ukraine? Um, And Biden has authorities like he's been using for Israel to send uh, a lot of artillery shells and artillery and air defense missiles to Ukraine that they need so much. Um, Simply, he has to declare that these weapons are obsolete and then send them. And he says he won't do that until Congress authorizes funds to cover those so they could replace what they sent. So in short, Biden is a big hypocrite. While he's claiming to stand for what he calls American values of democracy and uh, resistance to aggression, he's supplying Israel with the weapons it needs for its aggression in Gaza and failing to supply the weapons to Ukraine that it needs for its resistance to Russian aggression. So we need to keep demanding and end the military aid to Israel, calling for a ceasefire, calling for humanitarian aid, and then call for a resumption of military aid to Ukraine. Um, And at the same time, we cannot ignore other major things going on, you know, wars, like Turkey's continuing assaults and bombings and taking land from the Kurds in Syria, as well as bombing the Kurds in Iraq. There are wars in Sudan, Myanmar, Congo, West Papua. I mean, the list goes on. And if we're going to resist militarism and imperialism, Uh, We got to talk about those wars, too. So, you know, militarism and imperialism are big issues. And, of 
course, the world's diverted from the other existential crisis, because any of these wars could go nuclear, which is one existential crisis. But then we got the climate crisis, where the Democrats say, we did that. That was the Inflation Reduction Act, or what I've been calling Build Back Badly, because it's as much about subsidizing fossil fuels and permitting fossil fuel drilling as it is uh, supporting renewables. And, uh, and the Republicans, of course, say, drill, baby, drill. So we're, we're in big trouble. Um, there was news yesterday from a uh, raw story, an exclusive story. And they uh, found buried in that $1.2 trillion spending package that keeps the federal government funded for the rest of this fiscal year and that Congress adopted on its way out the door on Friday, March 22nd. They went on a 16-day Easter vacation. Buried in that package is a measure to take $375 million of the $404 million in the presidential campaign election fund, which pays for matching funds. And they gave $320 million to the Secret Service, mainly for reimbursing local governments for security services during presidential visits and $55 million to the Election Assistance Commission, which is almost totally defunded. And that was to provide security for the administration of the federal election this fall, this year, well, next fall. And these are legitimate expenditures, especially with the heightened threats of election violence coming from Trump and armed far-right groups. But this funding could have come from other sources, like cuts to the military budget, or to fossil fuel subsidies, or from raising taxes on the rich. Instead, Congress took a fund that is financed by voluntary $3 donations on annual tax returns of individuals and used that money for a different purpose than those taxpayers intended. I mean, I smell you know, grounds for a class action lawsuit. And the reforms that set up this, these are post-Watergate reforms, set up this presidential election campaign fund is like the signature issue that Common Cause won uh, when it was first getting started in the early 1970s in this post-Watergate uh, reforms. So they would be a good candidate or some good government group like that to, to do that kind of lawsuit. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, uh, Jill Stein announced that uh, her campaign had met uh, the Green Party, the, the presidential primary matching funds threshold, which is raising at least $5,000 in 20 states with contributions of $250 or less. And she's met that requirement in 25 states, 21 states, and will submit documentation and an application for funds within a few weeks. And that money, of course, will be used mainly to hire petitioners to get ballot access. But now we find that the uh, fund that would pay for that has been raided. Now, there's still $29 million left in the fund. They, they gave away $375 million. There was $404 million at the end of February. So uh, that should be enough, more than enough, to cover Jill Stein's matching funds. But what about you know, the long-term prospects for this fund? If Stein gets more than 5% of the popular vote in November, that would qualify the Green Party presidential candidate in 2028 to get a general election grant. Now that grant this year is 123 million and a half, 123 and a half million for major party candidates, which are defined as receiving 25% or more of the vote. Minor party candidates, which are defined as receiving between five and 25% of the vote, uh, get a prorated portion of that 123 and a half million dollar grant. It's based on the ratio of the minor party's popular vote to the average popular vote of the two major party candidates. So that really means you're talking about 10% of that grant. And the math works out so that uh, if Jill just got, just barely got 5%, that would be $12.5 million for the Green Party candidate in 2028. Uh, now, the remaining funds in the presidential campaign fund would cover that as well. But what if uh, Robert Kennedy also gets over 5%? Then the fund would be drained. And of course, the fund would be immediately drained if 
a major party candidate accepted that grant. But they haven't done so since the last one was John McCain in 2008. And since then, they have eschewed both primary matching funds and the general election grant uh, because to accept those funds, there are limits on how much money you can raise privately. In the general election grant, you can't raise any money privately once you accept it. And you have to limit your spending to that amount. That amount's $123.5 million this year. Biden and Trump are going to be spending billions. So, you know, what really needs to be done is they need to update uh, the grant so it's relevant again. Almost all the presidential candidates used uh, this fund from 1976 when it was first available until 2000. And George W. Bush didn't accept, uh, I think he didn't accept the general election grant, although he did take the primary matching funds. And in 20, in 2004, neither Kerry nor Bush uh, took the public funding. And then Obama said he would, but then he was raising so much money, he decided not to. Only McCain needed it. And since then, none of the candidates uh, of the major parties have taken the, the general election grant. A few of them have attempted, a couple of them uh, have attempt, have used the uh, primary matching funds, Buddy Romer in 2012 and Martin O'Malley in 2016, but they were really on the margins of the Democratic primaries. And the Libertarian candidate Gary Johnson in 2012 and Jill Stein in 2012 and 2016 used the matching funds. In 2020, I was the only candidate to even apply for the matching funds. And we qualified, although the FEC staff demanded more documentation, seemed unreasonable to us, uh, but we did provide it. But they set an early arbitration deadline to provide it. And my campaign manager, Travis Crystal, who did such a great job, he filed all the financial disclosures on time, closed the account with all the bills paid, zeroed it out. And we received no uh, fines for campaign finance disclosure violations, which is unusual for both major and minor party candidates. But after the election, I mean, we weren't a well-funded campaign. We didn't have people on staff. And Travis uh, took a new job with demanding hours, you know, basically uh, seven days a week, you know, 12 hours or more. And so he could not meet the FEC's early deadline for additional documentation. He did provide it late, but the FEC staff rejected it for being late on a deadline they set, which is not in the regulations. It was just their arbitrary decision buried on page three of a five-page letter. Um, in any case, you know, we also had a problem in 2020 that the FEC commission did not have a quorum because Trump had not submitted nominations to fill the vacancies that had existed since the beginning of 2018. So even if we'd got past the staff, there wasn't a commission to authorize and certify our matching funds. So 2020 was a tough year and we, we never did get the funds, even though we did raise over $5,000 in more than 20 states with contributions of $250 or less. And the fact that the FEC wasn't even functioning just shows you how little attention is being paid by certainly the major parties and the media to how broken the system has been able, has become. Now, the Raw, Raw Story article, which I will put in the link, maybe it's already in, um, they said they couldn't find out who uh, inserted this provision into that, you know, big uh, uh, spending, you know, $1.2 trillion spending package. We do know that both Republicans and Democrats have long tried to raid this fund. Republican Senator Joni Ernst of, uh, Ernst of uh, Iowa has long had a bill to drain the fund. It's a devoted to deficit reduction. You know, what are we, 86? How much are we in deficit? I forget the number. It's like 30 trillion or something. But, you know, this would just be a drop in the bucket. Um, and there are other Republicans that wanted to divert it to other purposes. The second version of the Democrats' omnibus election reform bill, H.R. 1 is what it was originally numbered. Uh, they submitted it. It was the Freedom to Vote Act in September 2021. And they proposed to completely eliminate the presidential election campaign fund. And what they were going to do is transfer those funds to a new fund for two programs for public housing of house candidates, a voucher program and a matching funds program. Um, and we objected to that. And 
uh, in the current version of their omnibus spending bill, they, they don't touch the presidential election campaign fund. But, you know, they voted for the spending package. I don't know how many of them actually knew this provision was in there because it's a monster bill of over a thousand pages and they only had a couple of days to, to review it. So it might have snuck by them. I, it's, it, I don't know if I can hold them responsible for it. Uh, we still don't know who did it. Um, but it's not surprising that it was done because Democrats and Republicans have had their eyes on this money for, for quite a while. Uh, in fact, last summer in July, they took $47.5 million from the fund to uh, fund the Gabriella Miller Kids Research Act, which is under the National Institute of Health. It's a 10-year initiative funding pediatric research. Again, that's, you know, that's spending, it seems, worthwhile, but it should come from cutting military or fossil fuel subsidy programs or from higher taxes on the rich, not the fund for public funding of presidential candidates. Um, you know, that public funding uh, system was the major post-Watergate reform. Uh, it set up the Federal Election Commission for better disclosure of uh, uh, campaign spending and donations, as well as the public funding option for presidential candidates. You know, one of the things that Watergate revealed is that Nixon was getting bags of cash for his campaign from wealthy individuals and corporations for a secret slush fund <coughs> that was used for dirty tricks like the Watergate burglary. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, the rich and the corporations expected favors in return. So this public funding program was an anti-corruption program. And what we got now after Citizens United and these other court decisions is a system of legalized bribery. And the rich pay for the elections and the politicians give them what they expect. Uh, you know, Watergate was basically a campaign finance scandal. And now the whole election system is a campaign finance schedule. So... As far as we can find, no other media has picked up on uh, this story from Raw Story. Um, I may write an article for Counterpunch about it just to let some more people know. But uh, the fact that nobody's paying attention is uh, a statement in itself. And the last thing I'll say a few words about is uh, dues. Uh, Amy asked last week about dues in the chat, and I said we would discuss it this week. And the original Green Party that came out of the 1984 National Organizing Meeting we had in St. Paul, Minnesota in August of 1984, uh, out of that came the Green, the Committees of Correspondence and the Green Committees of Correspondence. And finally, by 1991, the Green Party USA. So we had this party building process, formed the party, and all this effort was structured around a dues paying mass membership model. And this form of party was the invention of the left the workers' movement in European politics in the late 19th century. It was the way that labor and socialist parties figured out how to compete with the top-down parties that already existed from the landed elites and the business owners. And, of course, those parties on the right were funded by the wealthy and controlled by the wealthy from the top down. So the mass membership party was both a way to fund the labor and socialist movement and also for it to be democratic. So you'd have individual members, they'd belong to local branches, they'd be represented at higher levels of the party proportional to local memberships. And it was a way to build a, you know, incorporate, you know, the masses of people in the political process as opposed to what had gone on before, which was a top-down elitist, uh, you know, parties that, you know, offered voters, those who qualified. I mean, these parties were developed as the workers won the franchise in Europe. Um, it, the choices were given without the people participating in making those choices. And that's been the tradition with the American parties. They're memberless. We have local and state committees, but they don't meet to discuss policy and determine platforms for their candidates. They're mostly ways to, you know, mobilize ballot petitioning in elections. Uh, if you have an issue uh, you want to raise in your city or town, you don't go to the local Democratic or Republican Party committee. They don't have local meetings for that kind of stuff. You go, you know, you organize an ad hoc group or an independent group and you lobby your city or town council and the mayor. Um, 
So American parties, the Democrats and Republicans, <coughs> followed this top-down model of the conservative European parties. The only exception was the Socialist Party in the early decades of the 20th century. They were a dues-paying mass membership party. They peaked at a membership of 113,371 dues-paying members in 1912. Uh, of course, the early Green Party movement tried to build a mass membership party, but in the 1990s, we had political differences in the more moderate wing, uh, the left leftist wing of the party split off and formed the Association of State Green Parties that advocated that the U.S. Green Party adopt the organizational model of the Democrats and Republicans. And this went on in the 90s, and it was very uh, contentious. But Ralph Nader chose to go to the association's a convention rather than the Green Party USA's convention. And everybody wanted to be with Nader because, you know, the reality was his base was much bigger than either of the two Green Party factions. So coming out of that campaign, the Green Party of the United States was formed as a federation of state Green Parties on the model of the Democratic and Republican parties. So the state parties are the members, not dues-paying individual members. Now, some state parties are dues-paying membership parties, but most are not. And the result has been poorer funding of the National Party than we had in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the National Party now relies on donations, and the national budget has just been about 200000 to 250000 a year over the last decade. And that's just enough to support an office manager and a web manager, a little organizational overhead, and some small contributions to candidates and ballot access drives. It's a pitiful amount for a National Party you know, that's serious. It has less funds than most modest local nonprofit organizations with a few staff people or two or three staff people. Um, so we should have dues to have a stable base budget for the National Party. And, and think about it. There are 255,575 people registered in the Green Party, according to the last count from Ballot Access News. And that's just in the 23 states where the Green Party or the state election law allows people to enroll in the Green Party. And so one could estimate from that figure that, which covers about half the states, that there are probably about 500,000 voters that identify with the Green Party. Now, suppose the Green Party became a mass membership party and got just 10 percent of those who identify with the Green Party to become dues paying members. And suppose dues were set at $15 a month, which is what DSA dues are. Uh, for a comparable organization. They peaked at 95,000 members in 2021. But of course, DSA members tend to be more upper middle class professionals, whereas Greens are more skewed toward the working class. So let's say uh, we have $10 a month as our dues for 50,000 uh, Greens. That would be 10% of those who identify as Green. That would generate $6 million a year compared to the 250,000 we're getting now. With that budget, the Green Party could pay for a lot of field organizers to help build strong local chapters and state parties, coordinate issue campaigns, and support election campaigns. It could pay for the administrative and technical staff we should have to really service the state and local parties. So funding is one reason that we ought to have dues. And I think there is another reason uh, for a dues paying membership party that I think is even more important, and that is internal party democracy. Party members should have participation rights, but we don't have members or membership rights in the National Party. Right now, participation in the National Party is mediated by state parties, a good number of which are really small. They're just long-standing small cliques of old timers who have not and are not organizing anything beyond their little clique. They have the state party franchise for their state and they're happy to hold on to it as a small group. Um, rank and file registered Greens in those states or people that identify as Greens and new people who come in have little or no say in these state parties. It's hard to figure out how to participate in some of them. And even in the bigger and better organized state parties, the active membership flows in and out with the tide of events. They flow in when there's you know, a democratic administration and people get dissatisfied with the neoliberal austerity and militarism and corporate favoritism that we saw in the Clinton and Obama years. And then they flow out, you know, like they did when 
from the push of Trump and the pull of uh, Bernie Sanders reform campaigns in the Democratic Party. So you have to ask yourself, why should people who are not around building the organization, participating in the debates, developing our positions, uh, but do not support it financially, why should they have a say in party decisions as they casually uh, flow in and out with the political winds? In a dues paying membership parties with members organized in the local branches, we will have a defined membership, uh, a place for people to participate in party discussions, a defined membership with membership rights to participate in those decisions. And then representation at the state and national levels would be proportional to the dues paying members, living, breathing people in state and local parties, unlike what we have now, where the National Party doesn't count members, it uses a very complicated formula uh, using proxies for membership, like the number of candidates ran, the number of votes they received, how many are registered, and so forth. And these approximations are not equitable because the different conditions in different states, whether you can register or not, some states don't even collect reg party registration how difficult it is to get on a ballot so you can actually run candidates, the competitiveness between Democrats and Republicans in those states, which has an impact on the spoiler effect and therefore the votes that Greens receive and so forth. And it leads to absurd results. I mean, recently, uh, Texas, it was about 2018, or 20, around 2018, Texas dissolved because they'd lost their ballot status and people you know, just threw up their hands. And then the Republicans decided, well, the threshold was 3% in one of the statewide races. And the Republicans changed it to 2%, which would give the Greens a ballot line because the Libertarians had got qualified and the Republicans were worried the Libertarians were going to take from the Republicans. So the uh, Republicans wanted the Greens to take from the Democrats. So they changed the law and Texas had a ballot line and those Greens who had gave up came back to life. But for a period there, we had... And, and the formula gave Texas a large uh, allegation of uh, representatives on the National Committee, but there was nobody there to fill them. I mean, that's just the absurdity. Instead of counting living, breathing members and representing them proportionally, it's like the U.S. Senate and the Electoral College. Small states that are the least successful at organizing get disproportional representation. With a dues-paying membership, we'd have a common membership standard for everybody across the country for representation in the National Committee and the National Conventions based on one member, one vote. So I would argue we should become a dues-paying mass membership party in order to fund ourselves sufficiently and to function far more democratically. Now, how we get there and how we should share the national dues with state and local parties are questions you might want to raise, but I've said Enough for now, and so let's get to your questions and comments. Ashley R. How is pay to play any different from the DNC's fundraising strategy? How are poor Greens supposed to join? Well, poor people's organizations like the NACP, the National Welfare Rights Organization, ACORN before the Democrats destroyed it, were all dues paying membership organizations. And in my experience, you know, raising funds and we've had local dues and, uh, you know, working class people expect to pay. They don't expect nothing, something for nothing. It's more the, the middle class people who say, oh, the poor people can't pay, but they're the ones that are being tight fisted. So it's not pay to play. Well, I guess you could say it is, but it's not it's not some people call it a poll tax. That's about general election voting. This is about participating in an organization. And part of participation should be financing it. I mean, if we're serious about a Green Party, we can't go on being broke like we are. And, you know, poor people will join. You can have a hardship provision as well. So the people really are broke. You know, they can participate, but uh, un until they, you know, get some income, we can waive their dues. Vicki Corden, the United States needs to get rid of Electoral College. The Electoral College is blocking third parties. Basically, little choice for average citizens. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also electing people who lose the popular vote, like George W. Bush and Donald T. Trump. And you would think that the Democrats would uh, say, hey, we got a problem. The only Republicans in the 21st century first got elected 
by losing the popular vote, but winning the electoral college vote. And uh, I remember Hillary Clinton, she first got elected to the U.S. Senate in 2000. And that was the year of uh, Bush v. Gore. And her first news conference after she got elected was in Binghamton, New York. And she said she was going to introduce a bill to get rid of the electoral college. And in fact, there was already a bill that, uh, what's his name, Durbin, I guess he's out of Illinois, had had in the hopper previously. And he said he would, you know, reintroduce it. But you know what happened? Clinton didn't introduce the bill. Durbin didn't reintroduce his bill in that next session of Congress. And I don't know why, uh, but, you know, they, they, you know, what they do is, is instead of uh, blaming the Electoral College, they blame the Greens. Um, so, yeah, we should get rid of it. And there was an article that's in the Harvard Policy and Law Review from uh, winter 2021, I believe, or 22. No, yeah, somewhere in there. You can find it online. Google the Harvard Policy and Law Review and look for an article by Rob Ritchie and other uh, about four or five other authors where they go over, you know, how to get a national popular vote using ranked choice voting, which would replace the Electoral College. And they have in one of their appendices, a draft, a draft uh, law, you know, legislation that Congress could introduce that would effectively go around the Electoral College. And they cite uh, clauses in the Constitution in the uh, Article One dealing with Congress, Article Two dealing with the President, in in the Twelfth, or the, maybe it's the Fourteenth Amendment on voting rights, um, that give Congress the power to do that. That's their argument. And what they would do is basically require every state to do a ranked choice vote, and uh, they'd have a place at the national level where. Uh, those votes would be aggregated. There'd be a common national ballot uh, for the ranked choice presidential vote. And so it could be done directly by legislation without even going through the trouble of a constitutional amendment to get it out of the constitution, the electoral college out of the constitution. So these are things that if we had Greens in Congress, they would do it. You know, you, you wonder where the hell the squad and the progressive caucus is on these election reform things. I had an article in, uh, uh, Ralph Nader's uh, Capitol Hill Citizen, you know, basically calling them AWOL on ranked choice voting and proportional representation. There is a bill, I tweeted about it last couple of weeks, uh, that would create proportional ranked choice voting, proportional representation in the House and require ranked choice voting for senators. And it's called the Fair Representation Act. And this is the third session in which it's been introduced. Uh, Jamie Raskin is one of the sponsors. Um, another, a Virginia representative whose name is skipping me right now, has been the main guy pushing it. He's not even a progressive. He, I guess he belongs to the Progressive Caucus as well as the New Democrat Coalition, which is a centrist caucus. Um, but there were only seven sponsors. I, I haven't, the bill, I haven't, the bill was, they had a news conference, but the bill hasn't been given a number, so I don't know how many co-sponsors it has this time. But it only had seven co-sponsors. And among the progressives, you know, I think Ro Khanna is on it, uh, Jamie Raskin, uh, but not the ones you ought to expect. So in my article, I said, you know, where the hell is AOC and the rest of them on this question? And to me, that's why we need Greens. Uh, the people in office, uh, they got in office with the system we got, and they are hesitant to change it, even if it would be the right thing to do. So yeah, we got to get rid of the Electoral College, and if the Greens don't raise that issue, it's not going to be raised. Scout Trooper 164, I heard the Czech Republic completed the funding needed to send artillery shells to Ukraine. Any thoughts on the EU slowly stepping up, specifically France? Yeah, I just wrote actually a more than, I think it's about 5,000 word article that will be in Against the Current in the May issue um, about, it's it's titled, uh, Congress Fiddles While Ukraine Burns. And one of the sections in there, you know, ask is, is Europe going to step into the gap? 
and they're facing the prospect of far-right governments on either side of them in Putin's Russia and Trump's America. And they're beginning to say, how are we going to defend ourselves? So they've been having urgent meetings recently, uh, and they're looking into how to do that. But they're behind the eight bar. It's going to take a while. Now, the Czechs, they started this uh, even before Russia invaded, as they amassed troops. And they started looking around the world to see where these artillery shells were, both the 100, I think they're 122 millimeter uh, shells or 152 millimeter shells that uh, Soviet systems use and now Russian systems. And then uh, the 155 millimeter shells that NATO systems use. And they found, you know, 500,000 of one and 300,000 of the other for which they've uh, sourced contracts. And the funding, as I understand it, is coming. There's there's a dozen European countries that are putting money into this fund, and they should start arriving in 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 Ukraine any day now. So that's going to help Ukraine hold the front line. Um, and they've identified another seven hundred thousand shells that uh, are available for purchase around the world. And a lot of these are coming from countries that don't want Russia to know. Uh, that they're sending shells to Ukraine because they, they, they're former Soviet bloc countries or global South countries that have relied on, on Russian aid for years. Uh, but Czechoslovakia, has, or not Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, Czechia, uh, has identified these. And, 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 you know, those countries are willing to sell these shells. So the total cost is $3.3 billion. And they've raised a good portion of that from European countries. The U.S. hasn't chipped in. I mean, the U.S., you know, Biden could authorize that uh, right now, you know, because uh, I think, as I've discussed here, um, he has authority to declare uh, weapons we have or munition, munitions we have obsolete and, and give them away or sell them for a very low price. But he won't do that because he, he says... Uh, He's not going to do it until Congress appropriates the funds to replace those those uh, weapons. Uh, that's been written up in first guy to write it up was a guy in Forbes, David Axe, um, Reader Supported News, Wall Street Journal, and another major publication have, have you know gone through this completely. So you know the U.S. could be doing that. So I th I think the situation now is that uh, the Czech Republic has organized and they've been working on this for two years sourcing artillery shells for Ukraine. They're starting to arrive. They need more money. The U.S. isn't contributing, but the European countries are. Meanwhile, you know, uh, Macron said uh, maybe we're going to have to send troops to defend Ukraine. And, of course, the Ukrainian government said right away, we, don't, we never ask for troops. We want weapons and munitions. And uh, they still have that position. So Macron is probably saying that for domestic political purposes. In my article, I quote a left-wing socialist feminist from Ukraine, uh, Daria Subarova, who responded to that at a feminist conference in France, saying that, you know, Macron, as well as the far-right Marine Le Pen of National Rally, and on the left, the Communist Party, and Jean-Luc Mechelon, forget my, forgive my French, He's got a party as well on the left. They're institutional parties. She says these people are playing politics with Ukraine. We didn't ask for what uh, troops. We want weapons. And those parties, you know, on the right and the left oppose even weapons to Ukraine. Um, so uh, I think Europe is beginning to face the music. You know, they may be on their own, and they're they're beginning to figure out how to deal with that because if uh, you know, Trump is elected, you know, you heard what he said. He said, uh, you know, if these countries don't pay up on, on their defense spending, he'll, he'll tell Russia to do whatever the hell they want with those countries. Um, and, you know, he's threatened to pull out of NATO. And, you know, of course, his history on funding Ukraine, we know what he tried to do there. Congress authorized $400 million in uh, light uh, weapons, defensive weapons, you know, uh, Javelin any tank and uh, Stinger any air missiles that are, are 
man portable. In other words, an infantry person shoots them. It's not a big artillery piece. Um, but the first tranche that he had to send uh, was for 47 million. And he told Ukraine, here it is, but you can't use it on the front line. This is back, uh, you know, before the full scale invasion in 2022. He put them in storage as a deterrent, uh, which the Ukrainians didn't like. And then there was that $400 million fund. And that's when Trump called Zelensky and tried to shake him down. He said, give me dirt on Biden and his son Hunter, and then we'll release these uh, weapons to you. So that was uh, the kind of support that Ukraine got uh, before Biden came in. And then even, and I go over this in the article, you know, Biden didn't send weapons. He said, if, if, if Russia invades and the intelligence said they were going to, we'll put sanctions on Russia. And they sent him a few more singers and, and javelins, but not the kind of heavy weaponry. I mean, since 2014, when Russia first invaded, Ukraine has been asking for launch range missiles, tanks, fighter jets, uh, better artillery systems. And the U.S., you know, Obama's position was uh, not to send anything. He said he just wrote off Ukraine. He said after uh, Russia took Crimea, he said, well, you know, that's in their sphere of influence and there's not much we can do about it. That was in an article, an interview written up by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic called The Obama Doctrine. So, you know, the myth, the Kremlin narrative that, you know, we've been arming Ukraine and spoiling for this war for years is just nonsense. Um, so a lot of thoughts on the Czech Republic initiative, but, uh, you know, it's, it's part of a much larger context. <clears throat> Scout Trooper 164, Howie, do you think just for a moment that perhaps the Russians have infiltrated the West and are playing a role as to why the West is handling the Ukraine situation poorly? Feels like it strangely. I don't think they've got, you know, double agents in the American government administration. Or if they do, they're small. We, we catch someone every once in a while. It's more that their propaganda machine has been very effective. Certainly on the right. I mean, you listen to these crazy Republicans like uh, Margaret Taylor Greene and, you know, that guy in Florida, uh, Matthew Gates, and, uh, you know, all those guys, and Trump. You know, they repeat the Kremlin narrative. And then there's, you know, part of the left, the authoritarian left, that does as well. And uh, that has been very effective. And then you've got so-called, you know, uh, smart intellectuals like Jeffrey Sachs repeating it. I mean, he goes on Russian state media with, uh, what's his name? Sol Solovkov, who is probably the, you know, the, the Tucker Carlson, the most popular media personality on Russian state media, he's on every night. And he's called for nuking Ukraine and, and West European or even the Americans many times on that program. Sachs has gone on that program three times to repeat you know, this narrative. The, the state media loves him. And who is Jeffrey Sachs? He's the guy that uh, helped impose what he called shock therapy on the post-Soviet societies that, you know, sent them into deep depression in the 1990s. And I find it disgusting that progressive outlets like Common Dreams keep repeating, you know, Jeffrey Sachs's columns. They're the same column. He just writes another version of about every month. And he asserts in there things that are at least contentious, like he calls the Maidan Revolution, a CIA-backed coup, um, and he has a, he written in one of them, he referred to his timeline, which is on his webpage of events between Ukraine and Russia. And it's the whole damn Russian narrative. It doesn't include things like the Budapest Amendment or memorandum, where Russia, Ukraine, the US, I think China signed off on it, the UK. It was the agreement where Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons it had inherited from the Soviet Union in return for a guarantee of its security that Russia signed off on. And there was a subsequent treaty called the Friendship Treaty. Russia said the same thing. 
This is in the 90s. And in the early 2000s, they agreed on a treaty on what the borders were. And Russia didn't implement it on their side. They were supposed to put up, you know, border markings and so forth on their side. They never did because uh, Putin was now, you know, strongly in control. But that is not in Jeffrey Sachs's timeline. It just shows how damn biased he is. So you got this, you know, neoliberal economist, and he's suddenly the darling of the left, along with some, you know, realists like uh, Mersheimer, who uh, at the time of the Budapest Memorandum was saying Ukraine should keep its nukes. In fact, more European countries should have nukes on the argument that the more nukes, the more countries with nukes, the more stable things would be, which I think is just crackpot realism, as C. Wright Mills called it back in the early Cold War. Um, these are the people that the uh, we call them campus. I call them vulgar anti-imperialists because whatever the U.S. does, they take the opposite position without even examining what the issue is. Um, these people are putting forward people like Sachs and Mersheimer and even worse people like this uh, Colonel McGregor, who's a who's a Islamophobic, uh, anti-immigrant racist uh, who's on Fox News a lot. As uh, you know, he keeps saying Ukraine is going to lose. They they promote his stuff too. It's it's pretty pathetic. Um, so I think it's more in the information level, not personnel. Scout trooper, uh, where Russia influences, it's certainly influencing you know the the right half of the Republican Party. They're all conservatives or right wingers, but the, the far right, you know, the MAGA Republicans, as well as a segment of the so-called left, and even the pacifist groups. People think that most of the pacifists are saying uh, no arms to Ukraine, but you look at the biggest uh, peace groups like Peace Action and United for Peace and Justice, they have not taken that position. And they have condemned the Russian invasion. They say Russian troops out. They also call for uh, uh, canceling the foreign debt of Ukraine, which has got them caught in this debt trap. So now we're headed into uh, April, and when they return on April 9th, uh, Speaker Johnson says he's going to introduce a standalone uh, Ukraine aid bill. But we don't know if it's going to be as much aid as Biden proposed. Uh, they're saying it's going to be loans and not grants, which puts Ukraine in a deeper debt trap. Uh, Lindsey Graham, who has this position, was over in Kiev last week telling Zelensky, uh, this time you're going to have to accept loans instead of grants for your weapons. So, you know, the debate will continue when Congress returns in April. And I'm, I'm not bidding on anything. I, I'm not predicting what will happen. Uh, there is a discharge petition, which now has 191 signatures, that would force a vote on the bill that passed the Senate, which is both Israeli and Ukrainian aid. And the progressives won't sign the discharge petition because they don't want to uh, vote for the aid for Israel. Uh, there was talk about separating the two bills, but the Democrats decided to push the Senate bill. So the progressives are not signing that discharge petition, and it looks like it won't, won't pass. A discharge petition would force Johnson to bring the bill to a vote. So that's kind of the situation. But I think as far as Russian influence in the West, it's, it's a level of information, not personnel. Gira Brown, how, how do regular people get this genocide empowering government to stop supporting these sadistic Zionists and get aid into Gaza? Well, go to the demonstrations. They, they're frequent. Uh, write or message your, your, your member of Congress, your senators and your, your representative in the House. And it, it doesn't need to be a long, complicated message, although it can be if you want, you know, a serious letter, but just a short message. Because mostly what they do is count, you know, who's on who's on which side, uh, which you know influences what they do. Uh, letters to the editor, op eds, you know, talking it up. I mean, the kind of things regular people can do to influence government. We know that it's difficult. You know, public opinion doesn't translate into public policy too often in this country. Um, like the latest poll from the Chicago. Public Global Affairs Council on support for Ukraine shows that it's still strong. 58% of uh, Americans support more military aid to Ukraine 
That's 75% of Democrats, 54% of Republicans, but um, 54% of independents, but only 47% of Republicans. Um, but that public opinion is not translating into policy in Congress because they're playing their own games with each other and the Ukrainians have become pawns. Um, and it's the same thing with Israel. There it's, it's, it's harder because most Americans still support sending arms to Israel. They don't, they haven't grasped what, uh, how bad Israel is. Although the public opinion polls do now show that Americans uh, want to stop sending military aid to Israel. So, you know, there's another case where the public opinion is not translating into public policy yet. And the way we can change that is, you know, street politics and electoral politics, running our own candidates on that program and putting the people in power on the hot seat to defend their terrible position. Thoughts on what is going on in Haiti? Well, first thing is it's terrible. Um, and I've been trying to figure out, you know, what the Haitian people really want. I mean, there's the uh, international community, including the U.S., have uh, got the Caribbean community to uh, put forward a transitional council of leaders that would lead toward elections. Um, but there's a large segment of Haitian society that says this is outside interference. We'll take care of this ourselves. Uh, there was a council back in the 40s to try to do the same thing and ended up with Papa Doc and uh, very repressive because he he kind of took power from the rest of the council. Uh, and some of the characters on this council are capable of that or would want to do that. And then you've got the principal leader of the, the gangs, if you want to call them that, some people call them militias, uh, this guy named street name is barbecue. He wants a seat at that table until he gets it there. You know, there won't be peace from the militias or the gangs. So it's, it's very complicated. It's hard to know, uh, you know, whether to support intervention to try to, uh, you know, tamp down the violence or whether that will add to the violence. So I'm studying it, but I don't have a clear position on that. What I do know is we should be providing humanitarian and economic aid uh, so that people aren't going hungry, uh, that services uh, get strengthened. And a lot of the underlying misery that causes these tensions uh, is relieved. And even that's difficult because how do you get the aid in there? Uh, the city in the north of uh, Haiti, Cap, uh, what's that? What's, I forget its name, but you know, that's relatively peaceful and aid can come in there, but then uh, taking it to Port-au-Prince, the capital, that's where the violence is and how do you get it to the people that need it? So I don't have an easy answer for what we uh, should advocate. Um, I know it's a terrible history. U.S. intervention there has been, uh, you know, not in the interest of the Haitians, it's been in the interest of exploiting the Haitians including overthrowing the elected government of Aristide in the 90s under Clinton, or maybe it was Bush, and then the Clintons played a big role in uh, actually leading to a process that got Aristide reelected, but they also set it up so it made it easier for corporate exploitation. And then Aristide uh, got overthrown again, and that's, I think it was 2004, where, you know, <laughs> They grabbed him in his pajamas and, and flew him off to uh, Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo. He ended up staying in South Africa for many years. He's now back in Haiti and his party there, but they were, they were not allowed to participate in the elections, the last elections they had, which is over a decade ago. So uh, the U.S. hasn't had a, uh, has had a bad history in Haiti. So it's understandable that Haitians are leery of this council that's supposed to, you know, lead a transition to new elections. So 
That's the best I can tell you. It's it's tough. It's terrible. And, you know, we should support certainly humanitarian aid to get into the Haitians that need it. Andrew Hager. Howie, do you know anything about the Kids Online Safety Act, COSA, the Earn It Legislations, or the Affordable Connectivity Program? I think the Affordable Connectivity Program has been in existence and it, it's been defunded. So I just got a letter from my uh, internet provider saying that uh, they've been uh, reducing my bill by $30 a month under this program and it's stopping. Next month, I'm gonna have to pay $30 more. Um, and I don't know the details and ins and outs of that, subsidizing people that are low income or in low income neighborhoods. Uh, the whole system should be uh, cheaper and, and faster and more reliable and universal. South Korea's done it. They get much higher speed uh, connectivity uh, at a much lower price, you know, a fraction of what we're paying. It's like drugs, but we let these, you know, big uh, internet service providers, these tech companies, and they got, you know, a shared monopoly and they just rip us off. So there definitely needs to be legislation there. Kids Online Safety Act, um, I don't know the details of that act or the earn it bill. I'm sorry, but via email, comments on the U.S. abstaining and allowing the U.N. ceasefire resolution to pass. Um, well, it was a weaker resolution than the one that uh, the U.S. Uh, vetoed, but it was stronger than the one that the U.S. put forward and uh, Russia and China vetoed. Um, and the U.S. says it's not binding. Other people say it is binding. Um, I think on the whole, it was positive that the U.S. moved. Uh, Netanyahu was really pissed off, but that's okay. He, he deserves to be pissed off. Um, so I think, you know, the U.S. is moving, but they're hypocrites, as I pointed out. They're providing this big arms package right now to Israel. They're saying, don't invade Rafa, stop killing so many civilians, get humanitarian aid. Oh, and by the way, here are thousands of, you know, high explosive bombs and 25 F-35 fighter jets. I mean, it's inconsistent. It's hypocritical. It's contradictory. So, you know, the U.S. is not where it needs to be on this question. I'm looking at the chat. Ashley's saying the COSA bill is basically anti-kid, anti-trans. Uh, and... Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I don't know the details of that particular bill, but I know that, you know, a lot of state legislatures, and I, this sounds like a congressional bill, uh, they are scapegoating trans for problems they have nothing to do with. Uh, it allows, Ashley says, fundy parents to censor their kids' ability to reach out for help. So fundy, I guess, means fundamentalist Christian. And uh, Andrew Hager, those bills will do more harm than good to LBGTQ children in case they are in abusive households. Yeah, well, it sounds like something we need to oppose. And, uh, you know, this whole scapegoating politics, whether it's immigrants or LGBTQ people, uh, that's the right wing's playbook. And, you know, for the progressive side of the spectrum uh, really has to stand strong against that and not be offended if they call you woke, <laughs> which is, you know, their word of abuse these days. But so what? You know, I should have a button that say I'm woke. What's wrong with being woke? It's better than being asleep on these issues. Okay, well, uh, I went on longer at the beginning than I thought I would, but... Uh, I'm glad I was able to get, you know, a response to some of your questions. Uh, next week, I will be in Chicago at a conference called the Platypus Society, which is left-wing students and professors 
Now, I've spoken at some of their stuff in New York City. Now they're flying me out there to speak at their opening and closing plenary. So on Saturday, uh, hopefully I'll be able to grab somebody interesting to bring on the podcast, which I'll have to do from uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, or if not, you know, we'll do question and answers. And uh, But I'll be here next week. I hope you will be too. And same time, same place. Have a good week.